Welcome back. In our previous session, we looked at alert triage and case creation. That is, how do we start with an alert that was triggered by known malicious or suspicious events, determine whether it's a legitimate cause for concern, and then record an investigation of its root causes. In this session, we're going to be working with something a little more nebulous, threat hunting. Threat hunting is not investigating known bad events, but rather combing through the logs and data that we've accumulated in Security Onion to find problematic events that are not covered by our alert signatures and look for unusual behavior. I would like to say up front that this video is not intended to be a comprehensive introduction to the topic of threat hunting, but rather to show you how to use the hunt and dashboard tools in Security Onion to enable your own hunting activities. Every hunt needs to begin with a hypothesis. For this video, we're going to start with a simple one. If there's HTTP traffic on my network that is not going to destination port 80, that's suspicious and should be investigated. I'm going to walk through how to find this anomalous traffic, how to pivot between different tools to investigate it, and how we can tie different logs together to get a complete view of what's happening on the network. Let's get started. As always, we begin by logging into the Security Onion console using the credentials that we established during installation. Once we're logged in, we'll start with the Hunt console. That's the link with the crosshair icon on the left-hand side of the screen. Hunt is a tool that we developed in Security Onion to make it easy for analysts to query, stack, compare, and investigate the tremendous number of records ingested in a typical Security Onion deployment. Let's start with a quick introduction to the interface, and then we'll get into how to use it. At the top, you can see that there's an Options dropdown. The first option, Automatically Apply Filters, Groupings, and Date Ranges, affects whether or not a query is automatically run every time you make a change in the search parameters. Personally, I like to leave this turned on, but if you prefer, you can turn it off, and then queries will only be run when you intentionally press the Hunt button on the right-hand side of the screen. The next three sliders exclude data from cases, detections, and logs from the Security Onion console from showing up in your search results. These are enabled by default because it can lead to confusion if you're searching for a hash value or an IP address and getting results from a past case intermingled with your current results. That said, if you'd like to search cases for a particular tag or category, this would be the place to do it. Just like in the alerts interface, you can also set an automatic refresh interval here, as well as a local time zone for this browser window. A reminder, all the data in Security Onion is recorded in UTC, but it's displayed according to the local browser's time zone. If you'd like to override your browser setting to show it in a different time zone, you can make that selection here. Here in the upper right corner, there's a total found count for the number of records returned by the current query. In this case, we've got a little over 400,000 records ingested over the past 24 hours. Below that is the time selector, which works the same way here as it does in alerts. It's set to relative time by default, but clicking on the clock icon will allow you to change it to absolute time and retrieve events from a precise time frame in the past. In the upper left corner is the query dropdown. Like in the alerts interface, the down arrow reveals a list of pre-configured queries that we'll investigate in a moment. Unlike the alerts interface, however, this query box is actually a freeform text box that we can manually type queries into. The query language is what we call onion query language, which is very similar to Apache Lucene, but with some grouping transforms that we'll explore in a moment. As you can see right now, the default query is star, that is, show me all of the records for the past 24 hours, and group them together by observer name. Since this is an eval installation of Security Onion, the only observer is the Security Onion box itself, which is not very exciting. This is a little more interesting. We've now updated the query to say, still show us everything, but now group it together by the module that produced the record, and within that module, by the data set that it fits into. Notice that our metric graphs have updated. The bar graphs now show how the event modules rank from most to least common. And below that, our group metrics are showing a count of the number of records for each combination of module and data set. Here near the top of the list, we've got Suricata alerts, that is, alerts generated by our network intrusion detection system. We've also got a lot of different network metadata logs here generated by Zeek which is where we're going to start with our threat hunt. Every network flow observed by Security Onion is recorded as a connection record at the very least, and as a higher level protocol record like HTTP or DNS if it matches the specifications for that protocol. 
That makes it really easy to stack and analyze metadata about many disparate network flows because their important characteristics like source, destination, and so on are all normalized and recorded here. If we want to just look at Zeek logs, we can do that here. I want to take a moment to explain this menu because it's an important component for updating your query during a hunt and finding the information that you seek. The first option, include, means add this term to my query. So if I click include here, as I will momentarily, that will update our query to show me only records where the event module is equal to Zeek. Exclude is just the opposite. It will update the query to show me only records where the module is not Zeek. Only will wipe out the rest of the query and search only for records where the module is set to Zeek. Group by will add this field name, event.module, to the group by configuration in the query, while new group by will do the same thing, but will create a second table rather than adding it to the first. These items under actions are pivots to other sites or services. We'll return to some of those in a bit. Let's click include and then look at the top to see how the query was affected. As you can see, the query now says star and event module Zeek. That is, show me everything and only things from the event module Zeek and group it by event module and event data set. Well, since we're only looking at one module now, we don't really need the event.module group by. We can remove that by either deleting it from the query box or by clicking on this close icon at the top of the column. Now our query has been updated again to show me only Zeek events and sort them by data set. If you recall, our mission on this threat hunting session was to find HTTP traffic on non-standard ports. To do that, a good starting point will be these Zeek HTTP records. Each of them includes a bunch of HTTP metadata as well as destination port information so we can correlate them that way. Let's use the only option on the Zeek HTTP dataset in the group metrics list to cut our query down to just those records. Now, as you can see here in group metrics, we're looking solely at 2,672 zeek.http records after this update to our query. Scrolling down, you'll see there is a list of individual events here, somewhat reminiscent of the drill down list in alerts. As in alerts, you can click on the caret next to any of these to see the full record and all the fields contained within. There's some generic network connection information here, like source and destination IPs and ports, as well as some information that's specific to the HTTP protocol. You'll see things like HTTP user agent, virtual host, and URI all recorded here as separate fields. And any of these fields can be used as a pivot point or a new group by. So for example, if we want to group all of these HTTP records together by their destination port, we can do that easily by either clicking on the destination port and group by, or by clicking on this stack of papers icon over to the left-hand side of the field name. We've now sorted all of these HTTP records into four buckets based on their destination port. Some are bound for port 80, which is to be expected, that being the well-known port for HTTP traffic. The others, though, merit some investigation, especially port 443. Putting plain text HTTP traffic on the port normally used for HTTPS might be an attacker or a piece of malicious software trying to blend in with legitimate traffic. Let's go ahead and exclude the port 80 traffic for now by clicking on the 80 and then exclude. Looking at our query, you can see that it now says zeek.http and not destination port 80. So we should only be seeing records for HTTP traffic on non-standard ports. The group metrics here seem to bear that out. It looks like we've got an awful lot of these flows on port 443 and comparatively few on 8082 and 8080. Looks to me like these might be beacons, that is, data packets being sent from a compromised host to a command and control server. One way to check that theory might be to group the HTTP sessions by their size. If the beacons are regular, we should see a lot of identical requests and responses and be able to zero in on the outliers. So here's HTTP request body length. We'll group by that. And we see here that the vast majority of these are empty requests on 443. If we sort by this, we should be able to see which endpoints inside of our network are sending the most data out to the internet. In this case, it looks like our big winner is this connection with 4,580 bytes of data on port 8082. 
Let's zero in on that one. Since there's only one record here, we can pivot from the HTTP record to the full packet capture to see what exactly our endpoint was sending out. Looking at this, it appears to be a process list and maybe some inventory information about this endpoint being sent to a virtual host with only an IP address for a name. If I had to guess, this appears to be an initial infection from a malicious implant gathering information for future use by a threat actor. This endpoint should be taken offline and re-imaged immediately. Now, one thing that I would like to touch on now is the concepts of log ID and community ID. This log.id.uid field is an internal metadata field from Zeek that's used to tie together multiple records generated by the same flow. So, for example, if an endpoint downloads a file from a web server over plain text HTTP, that will generate a connection record, a file record, and an HTTP record. In order to make it easier for analysts to see all of these different aspects of the file transfer, they will all include this log ID so that they're easy to match up. The network.communityID field here is something similar. It's a hash of five pieces of information, the source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and whether the flow is using UDP or TCP. This is an open standard that is heavily leveraged in Security Onion. Most log data that contains those five pieces of information will have an associated community ID, which allows analysts to pivot between different data sources like Zeek, Elastic Agent Logs, Sysmon Logs, and Firewall Logs. It's very powerful stuff. If we want to see all the other records associated with this HTTP event, we can do that by clicking on one of these fields and then correlate under actions. As you can see, this opens a new hunt window with an OR statement containing the log ID and the community ID from that HTTP event. And then all of the other information in Security Onion is in these tables and visualizations. It looks like we've got a few different records related to the interaction between this endpoint on our network and what appears to be a C2 server. There are some Suricata alerts here, along with some Zeek records. If we want, we can concentrate on the file records by going to Zeek File and Include. And then down here, we can see the individual text files that were sent from this endpoint to the C2, including data like their size and their file hash. If this exfiltration were occurring later in the attack chain, we'd be able to see exactly what the threat actor had pulled out of our environment. Now, where did the original infection come from? Let's take a look at the other Zeek file records for this endpoint and see what we can find. We'll click on the internal IP address and include to add that to our query. And then we'll remove the community IDs because we want to see all of the different flows associated with this IP. You can see right here, we've got 61 separate file records with that endpoint as the destination. If we go down to this table to look at MIME type, we see we've got three Windows or DOS executables as well as one zip file. So our next step might be carving those out of the packet captures, determining if one of them was the initial point of infection, and then hunting through the rest of our network to see if any other endpoints downloaded or ran this software. So to summarize, that's the purpose of the hunt interface in Security Onion. It's a tool for analysts to quickly summarize, stack, compare, and understand the data that's being brought into the platform and pivot between different logs and views in an investigation. Even a very simple hypothesis, like HTTP traffic on non-standard ports may be a sign of malice or compromise, can be easily and quickly investigated with this powerful query interface. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, another important tool in the Security Onion console for this threat hunting use case is dashboards. Dashboards are very similar to Hunt, but include a tremendous number of pre-built visualizations for various scenarios. Let's take a look. The options menu at the top here is the same as the one in Hunt. The time selector and so on work the same way as well. This default dashboard is an overview of all the data stored in Security Onion. We've got information about the event categories, modules, data sets, and so on. Dashboards support Sankey diagrams, bar charts, pie graphs, and also these simple tables listing counts in each data set. In addition to this overview, there are several dozen built-in dashboards related to different protocols and event datasets. And these are all fully customizable, so if there's something that you'd like to add, 
All you need to do is write the queries and put it in the administration configuration interface. If we want to do a similar threat hunt, looking for HTTP traffic on non-standard ports, we'd probably want to start with the HTTP dashboard. Just click on the drop-down menu and select HTTP. As you can see, we've got a bunch of tables and graphs here summarizing all of the HTTP connection data in our environment. If we want to exclude port 80 traffic from our summaries, we can do that the same way we did in Hunt, by clicking 80 and then exclude. Now, we might want to specifically look at post requests rather than get requests just to see what data is being sent out from our endpoints. So we can include that. And now in the table at the bottom, we can sort by HTTP request body length. And we find that same list of processes and inventory information that we did before. Dashboards and Hunt, under the hood, are accessing the exact same set of records. Either one can be used for threat hunting and investigation. Where dashboards really shines is when an analyst wants to look over a lot of aggregate data in a visual format just to spot things that seem out of the ordinary. Being able to modify the query at the top of the screen and have it immediately reflected across all of the tables and graphs is incredibly powerful for finding a few strange events in a collection of thousands. I hope this video was useful for you and you're feeling excited about the threat hunting capabilities of the Security Onion platform. Remember, while the examples that we looked at today were using network data, these same techniques can be used with endpoint logs, network logs, cloud service logs. Literally anything that you bring in via an Elastic integration will be parsed and normalized by the platform. And please join us in the next video to learn how to close the loop and write detections for the new artifacts and IOCs that you discover during your threat hunts. Detection engineering, coming up next. Mm -hmm.